We are fundamentally a games company, technically the most active investor in the Web3 space. I know that you have invested in more than 500 companies, right? We really believe in this idea of network effects across Web3. The reason we call it the open metaverse is because the important part is that it's open. It's hard to pick milestones because your historical Web2 milestones don't necessarily apply. Tokens are the language of Web3. If you can afford it, give it a try. I'm a little nervous. Who am I as a leader? Hi, my name is Violeta Chekhan, or simply VC. Indeed, I am a venture capitalist. I have uh, 12 years of experience in startups and uh, early stage investing. Uh, so this is season two of Web 2 Plus One with VC show. And each episode uh, will uh, have a very interesting story of top entrepreneurs, and we will also discover different use cases. And today we have Robbie Young, who is the CEO of Animoca Brands. Robbie, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for, for joining this show. Uh, it's such a pleasure. I'm really looking forward for this inspirational and insightful conversation that we are going to have today. So we are going to uh, go through several topics, uh, but just briefly, let us know what is Animoca. Uh, well, thank you for having me today. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on us, um, Animoca Brands, we are fundamentally a games company. Um, so we make video games um, and we're actually, I'd say, probably the largest maker of video games in, in Web3. Um, definitely, we have the biggest portfolio of games um, and we make all kinds of games from casual mobile games to sort of AAA console style games. And we're also a very active investor. So um, I think we're still technically the most active investor in the Web3 space. And we invest not just in games, but across everything in Web3. So infrastructure, DeFi, you know, everything in the cultural industries, entertainment, et cetera. Um, and we do that across uh, not just strategic investing off our balance sheets, but also through a venture fund and a private equity fund. Wow, wow. I, I, I know that you have invested in more than 500 companies, right? Uh, that's correct. Yes, it's kept us very busy. <laughs> Well, I'm uh, looking forward so to to talk more about like Animoca Brands vision as well and what to expect this year in, in terms of like investment trends and in, in terms of also like use cases and what particular you are like excited about. But we will also uh, look forward to know who is Robbie. So I also would love to ask like several questions and in the end, we also will have some fun. So in this season two, I prepared some game for my guest speaker and this is like the cards and it's like real cards so there is like blockchain here and it's 54 uh, cards with uh, 52 uh, questions so some of them okay. are very fun some of them are very personal so, yeah so don't worry it will be fun we will have a lot no <laughs> a problem. lot of interesting um, insights from this um, yeah, and there's two jokers, right? So, you know, like the standard playing cards, right? So it uh, has 54 and 52 cards and two jokers. So if we, uh, if you are so lucky and you have the joker, so then you tell the two truths and one lie, and then the audience needs to guess what is like two truths and what is, what was the lie. All right. So we'll have some fun there. Okay, so, and I don't know the questions, by the way. So you also don't know, no one knows. We will only find out this in the, in the end of our conversation. Uh, okay. So first of all, I would love to start like with a little bit of your personal story. Um, I mean, Aminika, uh, Animuka Brands is, um, is a very interesting company because you started as a gaming software company, right? And you've been uh, a CEO with, uh, with the company since 2014, right? So you've been playing a pivotal role uh, in terms of transition of the company to Web3 space. So who are you as a leader? So who am I as a leader? Um, I think probably the best way to describe it is um, I think I'm uh, I think I'm a very good team player um, because I think you know we've grown a lot over the last six or seven years, particularly since we pivoted to the blockchain space. And I think it really is the product of a, of a team effort because the one nice thing about working with the same group of people for a long time is you really start to get a, 
feel and a sense of where everybody's strengths are and weaknesses, of course, too. So you really start to complement each other over time. Um, I think for myself, I've always been in the technology business. Um, and so, you know, what we're doing today is really just the sort of middle stage of a, of a long journey that started, you know, with analog telecommunications years ago, um, and then through the first generation of the internet in the 90s, um, and then uh, all the way through to mobile gaming uh, for the last decade or so. And so I think that really what we're doing in Web3 now is kind of the culmination of all of those things, because, you know, we do see this as kind of the natural evolution of where the web is going. Um, and so, you know, I'm quite fortunate that that all of these other things have kind of prepared me for this. Do you have uh, people s still working with you from 2014? Definitely. So, of course, I mean, obviously, Yat, uh, who is the co-founder of the company um, and my old friend, you know, he was the one who asked me to join originally. So he and I have been together doing this since since I joined him in 2012. Um, but he has actually, you know, we have people uh, who preceded me. Um, and so we have colleagues in the office who've been with Yat for more than 20 years. Um, and, and he and I have been friends for 25 years as well. So, um, so I think there's a, there's quite a number of us who remember, um, you know, the early days of web adoption in, and browser adoption in the nineties. And so that's why I think we quite like web three, because we see a lot of parallels between, um, the rate of adoption of web browsers in the nineties and the rate of adoption of blockchain infrastructure or wallets now, um, and I think it's those parallels that give us a lot of confidence that we see where the growth is coming from in Web3. Because I think if you go back to the Web1 days, you know, in 1997 or 98, it was very difficult to convince many people that the internet was actually going to be an important part of their lives. They didn't see a need for it, you know. You, you told somebody that they would buy their clothing over the internet and they thought you were crazy. They're like, well, why would, you know, you can't try the clothes on. Why would you ever do that? That makes no sense. Um, and so sometimes these things take a while to develop. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, history that you've been uh, watching basically, right? So how is it like you seeing involving and also like the internet and like the, in, uh, like the NFTs as well, evolving in the next years and what Animica brand's role will be in it? Sure. I mean, our clear mission is to help, um, I mean, spread this idea of digital property rights because we think that particularly for gamers but basically for everybody online they don't appreciate the fact that since content transitioned from being on physical media to being largely you know digitally distributed it's a sen we're essentially in a world where content um, is valued at nothing because it's infinitely copyable and so we have all these streaming services to help us uh, you know, manage copyright and distribution. And the problem with that is that um, people don't actually have any ownership of the content that they create or the content they consume. So Web3 now gives us the ability to actually own that content, which is kind of funny because it's just one generation ago when we were very used to owning our content. We used to buy records or we would buy DVDs and videos and things. And the idea of owning our content was normal. Um, so it's only for the last 10 years or so that we have stopped owning our content and just basically subscribing to an unlimited um, feed of content, so to speak. Um, but in so doing, we've given up any ownership and therefore any ability to create asset value in the things that we buy online. So once we can start creating asset value, we think the world will be a much more interesting and ultimately more fair place. Yeah, um, actually, there is also a very interesting thing about uh, the ownership, right? So we are talking about the creator economy, but we also are like talking about like web tree economy, like in, in general. Is it like inevitable we are like moving to, uh, to web tree economy, is your opinion? I think so, yes. I think so, because, because I don't think the current version is sustainable. I mean, if you think about it, um, you know, everybody loves this idea of Spotify, right? Of being able to pay one low price to consume all the music in the world, right? But the problem is that the artists themselves, the creators of that content, are not being compensated fairly for it. And so we're actually, in my opinion, in this honeymoon period where 
the music that's available on Spotify has largely been created under old business models where the artists could make a living. And so they're not, you know, and, and the problem is that the new artists today being distributed on streaming platforms like that suffer because they can't actually make a living. And so I think what you will see is the amount of new content being created will continue to diminish over time because artists just can't make a living. And so it will die a slow death, but we don't see it coming yet because we're still in the hangover period of benefiting from old content. Yeah, there is also very interesting that um, you've been saying in another interview uh, about the education uh, and educational uh, content that the teachers also cannot uh, have the proper monetization from it. So that is a very interesting. So if you can elaborate a little bit. Yeah, sure. So I think the way we look at teachers is that teachers are essentially, um, you know, another constituency in the creator economy. So teachers are a huge cohort of creators. That's all they do every day, essentially, is create content for our children. And the problem is that teachers are fundamentally underpaid. You know, in every country in the world, we don't really pay our teachers enough. And so they often have to have second jobs or something to be able to make a living. And so many of them end up doing other teaching related jobs. They sell their content online or they do tutoring or something like that. And so what we did was we created a platform that allows them to do this. Um, you know, we have a business called Tiny Tap that has a web, uh, has a mobile application like for tablets that allows you to basically as a teacher create content whether it's you know presentations or games or lectures video content and then people subscribe to it online but we wanted to essentially um, uh, disrupt this streaming content model by creating um, uh, content modules that can be owned by the students and so what we did was we created what we call publisher nfts and these publisher NFTs, each NFT represents the publishing rights of an individual teacher's course. And so what happens is when you sell this NFT, the owner of the NFT owns part of the copyright of that course and therefore the revenue stream of that course. So they share in the revenue of that piece of educational content together with the teacher. And so what happens is that by buying that NFT, essentially they pay upfront a big advance to the teacher on the future royalties of their content. And then the smart contract feeds them those royalties over time as that content sells. So what we're doing is not actually anything new when it comes to the commercial relationship between the teacher and the publisher, if you will. Um, but we're leveraging Web3 technology to do it in a very low cost and efficient way and a way that allows teachers, uh, it allows basically anybody on the internet to publish content together with a teacher because you just have to buy the NFT to do that. And so we think it opens up a lot of opportunities for teachers, um, you know, now that anybody can help them to publish their materials and not just, you know, a small handful of educational publishers. Sorry, that was a very long answer to your question. <laughs> But you know, it's it's a it's amazing use case, and uh, yeah, I, I actually ask it because it's amazing use case. You know, like people say that the economic system is is broken. You know, like also there was a very interesting uh, Coinbase at the advertisement, right? So the that we live in the system. Uh, yeah, I mean, like there is many problems that actually the current economic system cannot really solve. And what is blockchain is actually promising and what you've been explaining, it's like alignment of rewards and alignment of the effort. Because teachers have been like historically underpaid, like in, in all the country, almost all the countries, right? It's, it was very diff, diff, difficult for them to make the money. So with these uh, new opportunities, uh, it's kind of like this rewards and effort, can, like that there is a promise of alignment. What do you think? Uh, what is your vision? Can Web3 fix the economic system in its imperfections? So I hope so. Um, but I think, I think the fundamental issue that's, that we talk about here is actually um, the distribution of income or income inequality. And that's the main thing that I think is causing so much discontent in many particularly um, 
developed economies. Um, we see this obviously happening in places like America, where the proportion of national income that goes to the top 1% compared to the bottom 50%, that gap keeps getting bigger and bigger over time. And it's that gap that I think causes a lot of social problems in society as well, because people sense that there is an unfairness to their system. And we would argue that much of this unfairness is actually built around the consolidation of power. You know, the lack of widely distributed, um, like the benefits of the economy being widely distributed amongst everybody who participates in the economy. And the perfect example is the big tech companies. So, you know, if you take social media companies, for example, um, the vast majority of the benefit of the network effects that happen of all the data that all the consumers provide to these social networks, that benefit is taken by the social network and by their investors, and they get the majority of those benefits. But the content creators and the users get very little. Whereas in a Web3 scenario, you can have the same type of application, but everybody has a stake in the network because, you know, if it runs on Ethereum, we all own Ethereum to participate in the, in the project. And so therefore, we all have a stake in the network and a benefit from it. So it much better aligns those incentives between the users and the content creators and the platforms and the investors. Um, so I think that this more fair distribution um, actually will result in solving many of these problems. So where we are now in terms of um, like transition to open metaverse. So one of your like also mission is uh, like to deliver digital property rights, right? But to consumers but to establish the open metaverse. So what is your vision? Where we are now? So uh, we're still very early. Um, and I think the idea behind the, op the reason we call it the open metaverse is because the important part is that it's open. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk, particularly from uh, obviously Facebook, uh, who changed their name to Meta, um, about this idea of creating a metaverse. But I think that it's important that we define what we mean by metaverse. And so I think, um, you know, for us, there is no such thing as a metaverse that is not open um, and a metaverse that does not use Web3 as its fundamental infrastructure or architecture because um, the only system that we see that is both open but also fundamentally um, respects uh, the ownership of property of its users is Web3. Because the key to openness is you have to have a way to respect uh, copyright and respect intellectual property rights, but you also have to have a way to interoperate content between software applications. The problem historically is that all software applications are siloed, right? So you play games or social networks or something, and they all exist in a bubble. And the users need to have their own identity system and they need to log in in one place. They do everything in this walled garden and then they leave and they go to the other place. If you have a metaverse, it all needs to work together so that you can go from one place to another. And the only way you can do that is if they all speak the same language. But the Web2 construct does not allow you to do that because in a Web2 world, it's basically zero sum. My view is that if I have a user who goes from my application to yours, the result is you gain a user and I lose one, right? Whereas in a Web3 world, because we can respect royalties and the tokens interoperate from one to another, users can move around to different applications, but it's not like we're losing users. They just move from place to place and they come back, et cetera, like the physical world. Um, so I think that... Um, Web3 is really the only answer to being able to provide that open source, open framework um, that we need to build the metaverse. And once you are like going from one application to another, right, so you can have like dig digital rights and you can have digital uh, also uh, assets. How do we actually ensure the value? The capture, the, how do we make sure that we capture the value? And also, you know, like with this all um, tokens and coins, there have been lots of speculation. And in Web2 uh, world, I see that many people are just skeptical and that is an obstacle as well for the mass adoption for Web3 because of the utility of these tokens. So how do we ensure this value 
uh, and utility in the digital world? So I think um, the most important thing about providing this kind of infrastructure is that um, it's open and that there are market forces at play. Um, because as long as we have an open and free and fair market, um, the market ultimately will decide on things like value, for example. Um, and so we've seen um, we've seen great examples of this already in Web3. Um, I think one of the things that we always try to avoid is situations where there is too much value concentrated in too few hands, because that leaves us susceptible to market manipulation, for example. Um, and that's why I think it's good that we have very, very open markets. Now, um, one thing about Web3 today is that, as you know, there's still relatively few participants in Web3. You know, we estimate a maximum of a couple hundred million users across Web3 and really active users, probably 10% of that, you know, 20 or 30 million users who are using Web3 on a daily basis. Um, so it's actually very small, right? It's just that the users happen to be transacting very large amounts, right? So there's a couple trillion dollars a day being traded uh, across Web3, even though the number of users is low. Um, I think that um, this will change over time. Obviously, the transaction volume will increase, but the average transaction uh, amount will decrease as more players, as more users come into the space. Um, but I do also think that um, it will just take time for people to get comfortable with the idea that the internet can be secure for them, to be honest. Because if you think about it, we have all grown up with an internet that we assume is unsafe, meaning that your data is unsafe, your transaction information is unsafe, that it's full of scammers. Like it's a, it's a really kind of terrible place if you, if you listen to the description. Um, but, but once we can start to get more comfortable with the idea that our digital stuff is actually truly owned by us and that it is safe and secure and that we can engage in transactions peer to peer, you know, I can send you something and you can send me something across the internet and it's a hundred percent secure and I can verify who you are. Um, and that's easy to do. It will not take long before this becomes a very natural habit for people. Just the same way that I think people, particularly since the pandemic, now have the habit of doing lots of, um, let's say, contactless payments using their mobile device, you know, Google Pay or Apple Pay or WeChat Pay or something like this. Um, and that's a very new habit, actually, in society. But it only took, you know, 18 months of pandemic and we all changed the way that we use money, essentially. What are milestones um, do we need to, to have in order to say, okay, in terms of adoption, we are here? And what Animoca does to reach those milestones? It's hard to pick milestones because your historical Web 2 milestones don't necessarily apply. They would be mainly around user numbers. And I think, of course, it's nice to have big user numbers, but I think it's more about, in my mind, it's... Uh, it's kind of what we call a smell test. Um, it's like there was a there was a famous quote from a uh, from a, a judge in in the court in the U.S. and he was asked um, to de to define what is pornography and and he said, well, I can't I can I can't tell you he said, but I can tell you that I know it when I see it. Um, and I think the same thing is true um, about adoption. It's I think it's a sense that we get of the maturity of what's going on in the space. And I think some of that will be represented by user numbers. Some will be represented by things like transaction numbers of transactions, which gives you an idea of just how useful uh, Web3 applications are for people. And then some of it will, will actually be about brands and about businesses and about um, you know seeing that businesses that you come into contact with on a daily basis are now using Web3 infrastructure for themselves. And I think that we're going to see a lot of Web3 infrastructure where it's not going to be obvious that it's Web3, right? Like DocuSign, where they use all Web3 infrastructure, but it's not obvious that they're using blockchain. You don't have to connect a wallet to be able to sign something on DocuSign. Um, and so I think this transition to Web3 is actually going to be um, much quieter 
um, than a lot of the consumer applications. There's going to be a lot of things that happen in the background, you know, supply chain auditing of big manufacturing companies and stuff. And, and, and this will happen without us as consumers really being aware of it. In terms of like adoption, right? So Animoca Brands became the largest validator of the Ton blockchain. And Ton and blockchain, right, it's uh, from the Telegram team. So in Telegram is very, uh, uh, it a, has a very big user base. So um, what was the strategic uh, importance for Animoca brands for this uh, partnership? And um, do you see that this will help for like adoption in the ecosystem, uh, Web3 ecosystem? For sure. I mean, I think, um, you know, obviously you and I are users of Telegram. A lot of people in Web3 are big users of Telegram. It's a, it's a fantastic uh, social platform. Um, and I think that their engineering team is frankly amazing. Um, I mean, the fact that you can use such a, a product like this with such a huge audience and, you know, and nothing breaks, like everything works all the time. It's quite amazing. Um, but we wanted to support the Ton ecosystem because we think that this is a really exciting new, um, new community that we can engage with a lot of our Web3 applications. Obviously, Ton now has... Um, around 900 million users, active users. Um, and because they have built in their Web3 Rails into the Ton application itself, um, you know, as you know, the wallet is built in. Um, and so that makes um, accessing that audience and being able to offer them Web3 enabled applications very straightforward. Um, and so we're very excited about that. We think it'll be great for, for user adoption. Wow, that's, yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's talk about the use cases. What are you excited this year? As Also as an investor and also from the perspective of the ecosystem as well, because you are like one of the most active, maybe even most active investor that been in the last year. Um, so what are you excited about, use cases? Sure. So I think... Um... My the thing I'm most excited about, to be honest, is just the general market sentiment because I think that when general market sentiment is good, um, it actually helps everything in the space. Um, it helps investors to be more optimistic and more um, less risk averse when they deploy capital. It helps builders make that decision. Oh, you know, let's go and invest more and hire more people and build more interesting stuff. It just it encourages people to take risks. Um, and I think that that's a good thing. Whereas, you know, during the bear market, it's very difficult for people to get a le any level of comfort with taking risks because people are concerned. You know, they don't know how long this, this um, you know, very difficult environment will last. Um, so I think this year, I'm very excited for, for not just the overall market environment, um, but I'm also excited about a handful of, um, you know, new platforms and token launches that are taking place. Um, obviously, we've had um, a lot of success early on this year so far. Um, you know, we had a, one of our gaming projects that we invested in called Pixels, which launched an ecosystem token um, for their business a few weeks ago, and that's been going very well. Um, and we're seeing a lot of interest um, across the gaming ecosystem, whether it's Ethereum or it's stuff we're doing on Solana or things that we're doing with ordinals in the Bitcoin ecosystem. I mean, frankly, everything is, is, seems to be um, attracting interest from audiences now. And I think that's a fantastic thing. Um, and frankly, if you look at Pixels, um, it's a great example of, of the ability of engaging gameplay to really attract a large audience, you know, because for a Web3 application to have hundreds of thousands of daily active wallets participating in gameplay, um, not just for airdrops, but in actual gameplay, I think is fantastic. Um, I think there's also going to be a lot of interest this year in obviously the intersection of AI and, and blockchain. You know, AI was a big trend for last year and continues to be one. Um, and seeing how these two big macro trends overlap and can support each other, I think is going to be a big theme for this year. Um, as well as I think a lot of um, blockchain applications that are connecting us to real world assets or physical goods. I think we're going to see a lot more of that as well. And you mentioned about um, the, the assessing the risk. So how Animoca Brands assess 
uh, risk versus reward and the investments, both equity and tokens? Sure. Um, so I think the first thing that's um, maybe unfortunately not great investment advice for other investors, um, but it's that we have a particular lens of investing because we are a strategic investor fundamentally. So we look at risk and we look at um, we look at our ability to um, help the companies that we invest in differently than financial investors. Um, because I think we look at every investment we make as being strategic in some way or another. Um, and at a, at a most fundamental level, we love to invest in tokens because um, tokens are the tokens are the language of Web three, um, and we really believe in this idea of network effects across Web three. And so, for us to foster these network effects, it's very important that we are token owners in as many diverse token ecosystems as possible, and that we can facilitate the free movement of these tokens. And so, therefore, um, we like to be token investors first, although we do invest in equity as well. Um, but I think in each case, we like to have um, tokens because we think that that's the fundamental language of Web3. And what about like the business models? What are you seeing right now in the market and what are the main themes for this year? So I think the stuff I'm seeing right now, um, at least on the gaming side, tends to be um, much more mature. Than before, I'm I'm seeing a lot of projects that are raising now that are raising like you know a solid Series A, meaning that they've already done one or two rounds of fundraising in the past. They've maybe got a playable alpha or a vertical slice or something like that already done. They've got you know hundreds or a thousand users in doing play tests, stuff that's you know that's really got legs. Whereas two years ago, people were coming with business plans basically because they'd only just set up their companies. Um, so now we're seeing much more mature Web3 teams. Um, and I think this is going to be very exciting because the kind of product that we're seeing is much more sophisticated than what the, what we were seeing in the last cycle. Um, in addition, um, we're seeing a lot of very interesting uh, middleware um, and infrastructure that is essentially facilitating um, Web2 applications to uh, put Web3 Rails into their businesses. And this goes now beyond simply, um, uh, you know, like fiat on ramps and payment methodologies, but real Web3 infrastructure to allow, you know, the interoperability of content or the, you know, automatic writing of, of smart contracts and things built into the way that the, the logic of the game or the application works. Um, so I think that's really exciting because, again, you know, it shows that we're in a different market cycle than than sort of the 2021, 2022 period, where the every time that we we have one of these sort of inflection points in the market, um, the base continues to grow, and and we've grown much more base than before. So the foundation of the industry, I think, is much much more robust. Yeah, and how do you see like also the, the quickly the business models has changed in terms of like the cycles. So it was uh, 2021, right? So the hype and uh, play to earn as well. And well, then there was bear market, and now we are starting to grow again. So how do you see this evolving? Because you you mentioned also like about like raising capital. So there is like two rounds at least. So it seems like it's mature because of the cycles. Yes, yes, it's mature, and I think also the the competition for startups is much more uh, much more difficult now because if you are a startup raising capital, I think you have to be able to demonstrate some you know serious substance. Whereas in twenty twenty one, you didn't necessarily need so much substance because it was very early on, um, and I think that um, in terms of the kind of teams that we're seeing, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of people like. This year, the, the first part of this year, there's been a lot of focus on products that have leaned into the very, very hardcore Web3 users, those so-called like degen traders. Um, and they've been very active, you know, with meme coins and all these kind of projects, which I think is more indicative of where we are in this new cycle. So we've we've had a tremendous period of growth that's been backed by um, the Bitcoin ETFs and the pricing of Bitcoin and Ethereum generally. So I think that the traders tend to lead 
the introduction of the market. We saw the same thing happen when they took on NBA Top Shots back in uh, you know the beginning of 2020, um, because they were leading the cycle essentially um, that began with NFTs at that time. Um, and then I think what will happen is you will start to see things settle down so that your, you know, volume traders will not be the majority of activity, but they will be joined by more of the mass market. But I think the early, the early adopters in the cycle tend to be the traders. And uh, you mentioned also like about uh, Meta and uh, lots of uh, companies building metaverses. So will we see like like new uh, like cities like countries like digital in the digital world? And what would uh, users um, what will make users to join a particular metaverse? What do you think? So I think what will happen is um, you're going to see a lot more metaverses come out that, um, I mean, that are basically gaming metaverses, right? So things along the lines of like Sandbox that, that we created or, you know, video games like, like Minecraft or Fortnite or things like that. Um, that style of gaming focused, like entertainment focused metaverse. But I think the key is that we're going to start to see them be able to interoperate content more between each other. Because for us to just make new metaverses is not particularly exciting. We need to be able to show people interoperability because otherwise we're really just building more games. So if they don't function with each other, they're not really metaverses. Um, so the, the one thing that I would encourage all of your viewers um, you know, to do if, if they're builders in the space, especially, is to check out the Open Metaverse Alliance, uh, which we call OMA3. Um, and this is a nonprofit consortium of Web3 projects. Um, and we all work together in our spare time, basically, to try to build these interoperability standards. So we're connecting all of our applications together. And we hope to then open source all of these, um, these uh, interoperability standards. Um, to the community so that everybody can start getting their stuff to work together as well. But we can always use more help. So please, if, if anybody would like who's watching, um, please join us, sign up and, and come have your say because we want to be a community-led organization. Yeah, that's that's really, really awesome. And also, it would be very interesting for the viewers to comment also in terms of their experience uh, of blockchain games uh, and metaverse as well. So what is the experience does it have? I also saw that you, you made like in the last year, um, like the strategic uh, partnership with Neom, uh, the future, the futuristic uh, city in Saudi. So can you, uh, can you elaborate? So how does it really work? What, what is the anime car there and why blockchain is also there? Okay, so I think the idea there is, um, it's part of our wider regional strategy in the in the GCC, um, and we actually just made another announcement this past week um, about our partnership um, with the Cast in Saudi Arabia, who we're setting up a Web3 innovation hub uh, in Riyadh, um, and so we will be, um, you know, putting staff there and opening our first office in the Middle East, actually there, um, and this is just part of our wider strategy in in the kingdom. Um, and so Neom is a part of that because what the team from Neom really wanted to do was to think about um, the role of Neom as a futuristic city in the metaverse. So we're working with them to help them to bring Neom into the metaverse because, of course, you want to be able to um, give an online give an online experience to people about what is Neom, what's going on in Neom, both for the residents as well as for people from abroad. Um, and to think about how this might be a role model for other cities around the world, because for them, they have a much easier job because they're building a city from scratch. So they can start to build something very modern, you know, without any of the baggage of, of the existing place. Um, and so we're working with them to do that. But at the same time, we're also working just to grow the ecosystem in Saudi Arabia um, as the hub for the Middle East for us, because we think that we see a lot of opportunity there both to find and and uh, incubate amazing Web3 companies, um, you know, like Nukta, for example, which is the first NFT marketplace in Saudi, which we invested in a couple of years ago. Um, but also to attract and bring great Web3 talent from outside 
to Saudi, um, again, to build out their presence for the Middle East. Because I think in the Middle East, we see an incredible opportunity for um, a, a high growth market, um, particularly in the entertainment sector, where we spend a lot of time with our games, because the population tends to be relatively young. You know, I think about 60% of the population is under the age of 30, um, with relatively high disposable income, which is absolutely perfect for uh, an entertainment company like ourselves. I think we are right now on the game. So I have I have this like fun, 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 fun questions. Okay. Okay. So basically like, so we will try to mix this up. Okay. So, and like, neither me knows what we will pull out or okay. like neither you. So let's just try to be fun. So I'm just like, you, you can see. So it's like all mixing. Okay. Okay. So, and then like, let's, let's basically pull out from here. You ready? Go for it. I'm a little nervous. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here is the question. What so it's, industry? Um, what industry? Yeah. What, what industry, industry do you think will be the last to be transformed by technology and why the last? Yeah, you can have a fun, fun answer as well to this. Honestly, I, the first thing that occurs to me um, is the book. I think you can't improve on a book. Because if you think about it, a book is a magical invention. It's lasted in pretty much the same form for a thousand years. Um, and they're very durable. They're very cheap to make. Um, if you drop it on the floor, it's fine, you know, unlike your Kindle or your digital device. Um, so to be honest, I think the book is here to stay. Oh, okay. Uh, interesting. Do you read books? I do. I do. Not enough, though. I, I honestly, I, I don't read as much as I used to. And I think that it's because I'm a victim of social media and Telegram and my email box. <laughs> I know. I know. What is the last book have you read? What was the last book I read? Um, I read a book about, um, oh, I forgot what his name is. Um, there's a social scientist, an Israeli social scientist who wrote about um, uh, heuristics about thinking, because I'm really fascinated about how we um, address problem solving and how our minds work to sometimes trick us into um, falling into the same kind of traps, you know, like, like you can have um, anchored thinking where somebody gives you an idea, and then you can't, you can't solve the problem or address anything without being caught on this one idea, right? Um, so I, I love, I love that kind of thing, um, as well as game theory and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting. Uh, also, as being an investor, and you're taking the decisions every time, right? So, uh, how the mind works is really, really important to know. Okay. 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 So we go for the second round. Okay. So it's Next not, one. it's not, uh, it's not finished. Uh, we go to the, yeah, okay. we go to the, okay. So I'm mixing, I'm mixing, I'm mixing. So, okay. Here is, here is the question. So, okay. That is interesting one. Which influential figure would you choose as your personal life coach? Oh, actually. This is an easy one. Um, so I have this to... This is an easy one. Okay. <laughs> I, and, and I say it's an easy one only because I have somebody top of mind because we were fortunate enough to actually have him come to our office headquarters in Hong Kong, um, I think about a month ago, um, to speak with our staff. Uh, and it's a gentleman named Simon Sinek. Um, and you might be familiar with him because he gave a very famous TED Talk that went viral about... <laughs> I don't know, 10 years, 15 years ago. Um, and he is a leadership coach actually now. Um, and he's written many books and he's got a very simple idea, which is he's, he said that everybody needs to find their why. So when you think about organizations and leadership and motivation, everybody needs to like, when you think about companies, like you think about Apple or something, the reason people work at Apple is not because they want to make a phone that you know has, has a really good fit and finish. They want to work at Apple because they feel like people 
think differently at Apple, to quote the commercial. Um, so it's about values and mission, not about necessarily the actual business that you're in. And so for individuals, you have to figure out what is my why. Um, and I think that's a really fascinating idea. I think I saw the Ted um, uh, video of him. Yes. Uh, I think I saw. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting. It's very interesting, but it's also uh, it's also about the people, why people joining, and you know, like Web three is also about community. So I think it's like a very hundred uh, percent great concept. Hundred uh, yeah. percent. Okay. So last question. So okay. So last question. So da 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 da. So we have like one one one, the last one. Okay, so we have here. Okay, so oh, <laughs> that's the fun one. <laughs> the most reliable place. Oh, okay. Um, so, what is the safest and most reliable place to hide from AI apocalypses? <laughs> good question. Um, so, I guess there are kind of two answers to that. You either want to be in the middle of nowhere, um, and so there are plenty of places in you know in America or Australia or other out in the desert in Saudi Arabia. Um, but I would say, actually, um, you may prefer to be in a big city as well, um, because then at least you're around other people and you're around infrastructure. I, I think one of those things is that's really important is community is always really important. So you want to be in a place where you have a good community around you to support you. Um, but hopefully we won't have any AI apocalypses coming soon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We hope that, uh, yeah, AI technology and as blockchain technology also will help us uh, to grow as human beings and uh, sharing great, great moments as community. Right. Okay. So we are in the end. So uh, let's conclude with, uh, well, we're sharing um, a powerful message, some advice uh, to young entrepreneurs who are watching. Um, what would you say? So I think um, the most important thing if you're considering getting involved in Web3 is, um, or, or starting a business is to just, you know, if you can afford it, give it a try. Um, because as they, the old expression says, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Um, I think it's a really exciting time to be an entrepreneur. And I think particularly in the Web3 space, um, you have access to capital, you have access to tools and things which have never been more um, more easy to access, frankly. You know, if you talk to entrepreneurs, like particularly um, in Europe, here where I live, um, or you live as well, um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was almost impossible to be an entrepreneur because it's so difficult to find capital. Um, and so now I think wide avail availability of capital and a lot of interest in the space are all great reasons, um, you know, to, to go out and start something exciting. Um, but I think you need to make sure that you have, um, make sure that you have a vision because you want to start a business because you feel like there's a problem that needs solving or a market that needs addressing. You don't want to start a business just because you want a business. That's not a good reason. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for such uh, inspirational uh, message and well, very insightful conversation to, uh, to be honest. So I'm, yeah, we are looking forward, uh, viewers and me as well, uh, to see much more from Animoca brands coming in the next years, in the next years. So, and this year also very exciting. So we are finally like in a market that is growing. So we are very excited about the space. Great. Thank you for having me. No, I really appreciate the time. Thank you. That was very, very, very interesting. So I just would like to encourage the audience to follow Animoca Brands on its platforms. So you can find all the all the links below. And also don't forget to subscribe for being notified for the new videos. And we will have lots of interesting conversation this season. And also please do like uh, the video if you if you like the this type of contact. And also please do share uh, if you're excited about Web3. Uh, economy.